I've wasted too much time. So I thought the negative means positive. So I collapsed. Say, ah, uh, you, they look at the thing, is a Dr. Koran <laughs> negative. I said, ah, why are you wasting too much time like that? <laughs> so, so in my mind, negative is, was bad. So I was almost falling down. Oh my, this is something else. Anyway. So waiting for um, Advocate Motivi to come in. Uh, anyway, just, just, just to while away the time, um, I, I have to find out who will need a PCR test when you are going back to your country. We have to arrange that because some few people have asked that they may need to have a test to travel out to their country. So we have to arrange with the with the, or the secretariat to organize that for you. So if you allow, if you allow, if you let me know who we require, then we can arrange that. Uh, because not all of us require. Some of us, when you are double vaccinated, you can go back without any problem. But if you need, then you know, in my country again, there was this. You know, traffic police, they are the most notorious police, you get them everywhere uh, in Africa. And this police officer, in fact, all the police officers are my friends, so they shouldn't come and attack me. But this particular police officer was standing by the roadside trying to check traffic offense. But you know, in Friday afternoon, late afternoon, not necessarily tra traffic offense they will look for. They want to collect all the bribes they can get for the weekend. So this police officer was on the, by the roadside waiting and waiting. The old car was coming. Then, of course, he saw a nice Mercedes-Benz car coming down the road. Now the police officer was confused whether to stop this car or not to stop. Because it was a brand new car. The man driving was in suit and tie. Probably maybe a lawyer. So he was not too comfortable. But he found himself stopping the car when the car got to him. So he didn't know what he was going to ask this driver or the owner of the car who was driving his own car. But all that he, can, he could say was that, why are you driving your car alone? You know. And the man said, no, I'm not driving this car alone. Then the police officer said, okay, they open your boot. He opened the boot. He checked, neat, nobody there. So I said, why are you driving your car alone? Did you hear the question? Then the man said, no. I said, no, I'm not driving this car alone. Then he said, okay, let me look at your back seat. He looked at the back seat, there was nobody there. So the police officer went back to the driver, the man in suit and tie behind the wheels. Did you hear the question I asked you? Um, I was asking, why are you driving this car alone? Now, in my mind, everybody will be thinking, if I drive your own car, what's the problem with that? But anyway, the man said, I have told you three times that I'm not driving this car alone. So the police officer stood back and said, okay, tell me, who are you driving this car with? Then the man said, in this car, I'm driving with God the Father, God the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the police officer asked him, you mean this car, God is in this car? I said, yes. Jesus is in this car? I said, yes. And all the Holy Spirit in the world in this car? I said, yes. Do you know that your car takes only five passengers? Do you know that this is your car? It's supposed to take only five people. Yeah. And you put all the Holy Spirit here. Get down. This car is overloaded. Come on, get down. <laughs> Your car is overloaded. You can't drive with all these people in this car. So you see, police officers, they have the law in their hand. I'm told that they have about 150 laws, traffic offenses that they can arrest you, including checking your car tire pressure. If the four tires, the pressures are different, they can arrest you, police officers. They, have, they are so powerful. So you have, to be, you have to be careful with them when you are dealing with them. 
is um, uh, advocate around my TV, South Africa. Not yet. Um, Oh, he's now going to do his PCR test. So, the, in terms of the um, the materials, mm -hmm. I've asked the secretary that uh, instead of waiting for the report and getting the material, some of you want it so badly, so they will collect all the presentations and immediately. Tomorrow, they will send it to the, your emails so that all of you will get the presentations uh, immediately so that you can, you can have a reference materials. Because there have been a very good presentations at this conference, just as we have had uh, in the past. So that, that also will be taken care of. Um, we also want to know, uh, there will going to be somebody coming to talk about uh, the gorillas and check whether people may want to go. And of course, how much it will cost because uh, that also will be uh, in, in, in making your mind, you should know how much it's going to cost you to go and view those animals. Um, I think I think that is that's fine. There, there's no other. Unless any other <coughs> any other person if somebody has uh, any question or something you can ask or approach me if you need any any assistance. Is there anybody from South Africa here apart from Advocate Motibi? Can you find out where he is, please? Sorry? Okay. Okay. With the jokes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, those of you who know my country, Ghana, there is um, a big cemetery. We call it the Usu Cemetery. It's one of the most renowned cemeteries in the country. Um, now, there was these two boys who have gone to town, city center, to play truancy. So they were coming home and they have to pass by the cemetery. Then the cemetery is walled. And they saw that there were a lot of mango trees, mangoes, succulent ones, in the cemetery. So they decided to go and pluck these mangoes and go and sell them. So when you are eating mangoes, you should be careful where they are coming from. Anyway, they got into the cemetery. They couldn't go through the main gate because they didn't have any dead bodies they were going to bury. So the gatekeeper would not allow them in. So they went back and climbed the wall, got into the cemetery, went into where the mango trees were, climbed the mango tree, plugged all the ripe mangoes down, and then they settled down to share. And this is how they were sharing it. They were two boys. So I take one, you take one. I take one, you take one. I, so they were taking one in turns. I take one, you take one. I take one, you take one. But before they could finish, they realized that when they were collecting the mangoes into, together, they missed two of the mangoes under a leaf somewhere. So they checked out. Oh, well, the two mangoes are somewhere there. Then they said, oh, let's finish sharing. After sharing the hip, we'll take one of those, that two mangoes, then we go away. So they were sharing. Then it was like six in the evening. The caretaker could hear the noises right in the middle of the cemetery. And he couldn't believe. So he went to a pastor who was staying 
behind the cemetery. Who, he had been officiating uh, burials and all that. They knock on this man's door. He said, Pastor, come and listen to something that is going on in the cemetery. He said, what could it be? He said, you come. So they went. They stood behind the wall. All that they could hear is that I take one, you take one. I take one, you should take one. I take one. Then immediately the pastor did a sign of cross. He said, you know what? He said, what can it be? He said, you see, Jesus and Satan are sharing the deaths. He said, ah, then it was going on. I take one, you take one. They were taking one in tens. Then the boys finished sharing the mangoes. This pastor and the caretaker were outside the wall. They were still listening. All that they could hear was that, what about the two outside? <laughs> Meaning, for the boys, the two mangoes they left. Yes. But for the pastor and the caretaker, they, he meant them. Immediately, the pastor heard this. Uh, who is the fastest man on earth? He started running. Run and run and run. And then the caretaker was still also trying to catch up. So the pastor, the, the, the pastor went far away from the cemetery, panting. And the caretaker caught up. He said, Pastor, why were you running so fast? Then the pastor said, But I've told you that Jesus and Satan were sharing the dead. They finished sharing all the deaths. So they are coming to the living. And they were starting with you and I. And you wanted me to stand there. Then the caretaker said, but Pastor, you've been preaching all the time that you're going to go to heaven. So if I've stood there, Paul means Jesus would have taken you. Pastor said, hey, you can't be sure. You can't be sure. <laughs> so even pastors are not sure <laughs> whether they'll be taken to heaven. So that's it. So normally, if you are buying mangoes, you have to be careful because you don't know. Ah, hey, honorable. Okay. Now, before I hand over to Advocate Matibi, uh, I have a surprise for him because this man is celebrating his birthday today. So we need to congratulate him on his birthday. And those who have a good voice, you know, those who have cockroach voice, we should sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jeremy. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So um, you're going to have your presentation. Yes. So the floor. Oh, they haven't finished it. I'm working at 8:30. Eh? Have you done your COVID test? You haven't gone to do. Yeah. You have done it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 34. 34, okay. 34, <laughs> <laughs> Right. So for this presentation, fifth, Zambia. Uh, can Zambia, you uh, sharing this presentation. So Zambia, please come up front and take your position. Probably you may also want to sit for the chairman to introduce. So you go to... To the state. Yeah, the state. Yes, okay. thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think most of the things have been uh, said by uh, Dr. Corentin. Uh, I think. Uh, Motibi has been uh, uh, adequately introduced. Uh, my task is, of course, to also introduce him in terms of uh, his achievements, as well as to chair this, uh, this session. Uh, in terms of credentials, uh, like uh, and advocate Andy Lekgoa Motibi holds a Bachelor of Proc and LLB from the University of Northwest South Africa and the University of South Africa, respectively. He is the head of Special Investigating Unit in South Africa. He was appointed by the President of, by the President of South Africa in May 2016. He is tasked 
to lead the uh, special investigating unit and to in execute its mandate to investigate maladministration, malpractice, and corruption within the state institutions and the private sector as authorized by proclamations issued by the President of South Africa. In October 2013, Advocate Motibi was appointed as an executive director at MedScheme Holding, holding a subsidiary of Afrocentric Health, where he championed the successful implementation of the Afrocentric Enterprise Risk Management Framework. One of the key initiatives was the reorganization of the Group Forensic Investigations Business Unit, which improved the forensic investigations capability and recoveries. In 2005, he was appointed the head of compliance at South African Airways. After completing the implementation of South African Airways Enterprise and Compliance Risk Management Framework, he was appointed at NetBank as senior manager enterprise, a senior manager enterprise risk management in 2007. Advocate Motibi started his uh, career as a public prosecutor in the magistrates and regional courts in the Johannesburg and Soweto magistrates courts. He also served on the bench as a magistrate in the Johannesburg and Soweto magistrates courts. He was appointed to head employee relations at the then Department of Finance in 1995. He was part of the project that worked on the establishment of the South African Revenue Service. At, South Afri at, at, at SARS, he, was, he also served in the roles of the head of corporate legal services and the head of governance. Advocate Motibi is currently the Vice President of International Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities and Chair of South African Development Community, SADC, Anti-Corruption Committee. This is indeed a rich, uh, okay. This is indeed a rich uh, CV. So uh, at this point in time, I'm sure we're eager to hear from him in terms of uh, what he has to share with us. May I invite Advocate Motibi? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Koranteng, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to present to this August House and this uh, heads of anti-corruption agencies in the Commonwealth Africa. I also greet you, my colleagues, uh, the various heads of anti-corruption agencies in the Commonwealth Africa and all the officials. Uh, I also greet uh, Madam Ombuds person of the Rwanda uh, Anti-Corruption uh, Authority. Uh, my colleagues who are with me from South Africa, the Special Investigating Unit, good morning. Uh, let me first really render my sincerest apologies Dr. Well, uh, Dr. Koranteng, um, I probably missed the resolution uh, for 8 o'clock. I was working on 8.30, and my daughter started singing for me this morning. I said, please don't sing too long. Uh, we are starting now at 8.30. Uh, so I really apologize for that. We do respect time and just show respect to your counterparts. Um, I'm going to present today uh, the presentation uh, on, the, on the International Association of Anti-Corruption uh, Authorities. And, and we're really thankful, uh, Dr. Quarantine, that you gave us this opportunity to present. Um, I'm actually wearing two hats. I'm wearing two hats as a member of the uh, Commonwealth Africa uh, Anti-Corruption 
uh, heads of anti-corruption agencies, and also, and also as a member of the International Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities, uh, as a vice president today presenting to you. Uh, we, we, we are really thankful, and we really look forward to this very important uh, interaction uh, and, and taking some of the questions that may, that may come up. Um, I'm taking it that the slides would be would be uh, driven somewhere. I will indicate if I move to the next to the next slide. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this slide here, as you can see, it really most of most of the colleagues I spoke to a few of you that uh, are really aware of this association. Um, it was established in 2006. Uh, as an independent and non-political anti-corruption organization, right? And its, its objective being to promote the effective implementation of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and assist anti-corruption authorities agencies worldwide in the prevention of and fight against corruption. Up to now, IACA, that's the acronym, has around 150 organizational members uh, worldwide, including those uh, in, in Africa and, and, and in our region. Thank you. Right. Uh, as you may be aware that uh, the, the leader of the ICAC, they call it, Hong Kong, Simon, Mr. Simon Pei, he's the commissioner of the Independent Commission Against Corruption in Hong Kong, uh, was elected the president for a new three-year term. Uh, uh, and Hong Kong ICAC uh, has taken over the office of the secretariat in January of this year. So the elections happened uh, and uh, around December, January, they were completed, and uh, he was then, uh, he was then, oh, thanks. Okay, thanks. He was then appointed uh, as, as, as the president. As you can see there on the right-hand side, hopefully that you can read, I'll read it out for you. Uh, the, he really aims, as he's chatting to us and presenting to us, uh, he says he aims to foster members' communication and collaboration through regional coordination and mechanism and to enhance IACA's involvement in the, in the international community and to strengthen the secretariat support of, of IACA. If you turn to the next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, am I the one who should drive it? <laughs> oh. Yeah, no. Now it's not moving. There. Okay, it has moved. Thanks. If I need to go to the next, use this one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, we are here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, we, we are driving this IACA based on the regional coordination mechanism. Uh, and as you can see there, the regional uh, coordination mechanism uh, is really structured as follows. IACA members are categorized under the five regional groups with reference to the United Nations regional groups uh, of member, member states, right? Uh, IACA president has four vice presidents taking up the role of regional coordinators. Now, on the, on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's Eastern European states and the Asia-Pacific states, African states, and the Latin American and Caribbean states and Western European and other states. In, in, in the African 
states, uh, I really have the privilege that uh, as the Vice President and Regional Coordinator of the African States, and I work with the other members which I will identify uh, uh, soon, to ensure that, to really ensure that uh, uh, we, we have our voice heard in this association as Africa, so that we can influence the activities and the anti-corruption measures uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the world stage. Now, the, the next slide, yeah, it's, uh, we'll, we will probably leave you with this, with this presentation so that you can read it uh, appropriately. I'm, I'm not going to mention all the members that are on this slide in the interest of time. Uh, the new term of, of, of this, of this uh, uh, leadership, I would uh, put it that way, the executive committee, uh, led by Simon Pei from Hong Kong. Uh, it's got uh, Simon Pei as the president on the, on, on the left-hand side. And then we've got the vice president, uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Mr. Fikrat Mamadov uh, from Azerbaijan Republic. He's the minister of justice there. Uh, and then we've got the vice president uh, Mr. George Bermudez from the Chile Republic, and then another Vice President Charles du Duchesne uh, from France, and then, of course, we've got uh, myself uh, uh, from, uh, from, from Africa. Uh, in the middle there, the next level really just shows uh, the last president who was uh, 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 from, uh, from Qatar, and then, and then there's an honorary member there. Below all those, all those all, below the slide, it's all the members of uh, EXCO. But I'll just point out a few that are uh, in, in our team here in Africa uh, to make sure that uh, we galvanize the African voice uh, in, this, uh, in this stage. Uh, I've got uh, 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 my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Talib, uh, Talib Mbarak, uh, there, there he is, his hand is up, you can see there. Uh, he's the Secretary and Chief Executive Officer, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission in Kenya. My brother, my colleague, comrade, thank you very much. We are prepared and determined to ensure that uh, we really participate effectively uh, in this association. And then, I've ha and then I have uh, in the middle there, as I said, I'll leave you with this slide so that you can read it at your own time. Dr. Dr. Navin Bakery. I don't know if he's arrived. Uh, we're told that he might be arriving. Uh, oh, he's not coming. Okay, sure. But, uh, but uh, our colleague from Mauritius, please send our, our, our message to, to Dr. Bakery. Uh, he's the Director General, Independent Commission Against Corruption in Mauritius. Uh, uh, he's serving with us uh, in that uh, in, in the EXCO, and then we've got His Excellency Mr. Mohammed uh, Bashir Rashdi, Chairman, National Authority for Probity Prevention and Fight Against Corruption in Morocco, and then we've got uh, uh, Ms. Mrs. Sinabo Ndlai Diakate, Chair, National Office for Combating Fraud and Corruption in Senegal. Uh, is, she, is she with us? No. Um, Senegal? Okay, oh, yes, she's not, uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, so these are the... 15, okay. Uh, these are the members of EXCO colleagues. Uh, we've got 18, 18 uh, EXCO members, including these, uh, these African, African members. Next. Okay, almost said next slide. Right. Uh, I'll go swiftly. I've got 15 minutes to go. Uh, this association has got a training committee. And the training committee, as we say there, uh, was, was set up in 2017. Members uh, uh, alternate uh, with the objective to propose, uh, oversee, and, and evaluate training-related activities. The committee co-hosted co two international training programs with the Hong Kong and ICAC in 2019 and Malaysia Anti-Corruption Commission in 2021, respectively. We'll obviously continue to assess where else 
uh, to host uh, the training events depending on the training needs of the members. Uh, the convener is uh, Mr. Pear, the president of IACA, and then you've got uh, the members of this committee uh, from India, from Malaysia, uh, from Mauritius, uh, and then from Morocco. Uh, and then we've got other organizations that are also members, like the International Anti-Corruption Academy, the Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Center in Qatar, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and the Secretariat is, uh, is IACA. Right. Um, you'll see now, I'll, I'll go swiftly on these few pages, on the website of, uh, of this IACA, uh, we've got uh, what we call the fact sheet. If you go through that, uh, that fact sheet, really, uh, it, it, it will tell you what is it that we have done uh, up, to up to now. But on the website, you'll see newsletters, minutes of EXCO, annual conferences and general meetings, training programs, and also other kind of, uh, of, of, of regional work. Right, this is the continuation of the fact sheet. You can find the fact sheet on the, on, on the website. Uh, right, so I did, I did indicate that, uh, uh, let me see if I have not dumped a slide. Right, I'll, I'll just proceed from here. This is the members of the regional coordination of the African states. I think I've already mentioned uh, those EXCO members that work, that work together with me. Uh, this thing is proving to be... Mr. Motimi, yes. I, would oh, I would suggest that may perhaps the IT helps you to scroll yeah. from page to page as yes. you... Please uh, concentrate on your Just presentation. Just in the interest of time, if they, in the interest if of they are time. able to roll the slides for me. Yes, please. please. Right. Uh, can you can you move on? Yeah. Stop. Stop here. Uh, the IACA members in in Africa, uh, we've got quite a quite a number of uh, African African states. Uh, that are that are members of of, of IACA. Uh, those are the names there, and I, will, I won't go through through them in in detail. Next slide. Can you roll down? These are the uh, coordinating members in the African state that I've mentioned. I want to just spend a few minutes on the next slide. Thanks. Uh, the inaugural meeting of our uh, regional uh, part uh, was convened on the 21st of uh, of February. Uh, the coordination efforts are really to increase the membership of IACA in the African region, which includes partnering, engaging with organizations uh, such as our organization, Commonwealth uh, Africa, uh, ascertain the training needs. We will be engaging to, with you to ensure that we understand the training needs so that we can incorporate those training needs. Uh, a training needs capacity survey will be, will be circulated. Uh, so that we can assess uh, the potential and the needs. Uh, the regional coordination uh, shall also leverage on the efforts already taken in the sub-region on training, such as progress already achieved in the SADC and in the Eastern African region. A work plan for this uh, 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 term of office 22-24 was also developed and will be finalized soon. The members can also develop sub-regional work plans, which we will uh, work on. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, we, we have identified collaboration points uh, with, the, with the Commonwealth uh, Africa. Uh, of course, those collaboration points would be on anti-corruption measures, and this varies from various measures uh, that we can identify. Uh, collaboration on anti-money laundering activities, Asset, asset tracing, uh, you know that uh, transnational uh, uh, offenses really create a challenge, and the training initiatives, and of course, best practice uh, benchmarks. Now, next slide. Under the, under the anti-corruption measures, next slide, please. Under the anti-corruption measures, uh, there could be a concerted effort uh, on the implementation of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, under the anti-money laundering and asset tracing, through the work of the heads 
of anti-corruption authorities already established by Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, uh, both associations could utilize collaborations with other associations within the African region focusing on these areas. Work together to ensure that corruption is not beneficial by averting the uh, laundering of spoils of corruption. Next slide. Next slide. The training initiatives and best practice benchmarking, uh, both associations, Commonwealth and, uh, and, and IACA, uh, through the various annual conferences and training initiatives, create a platform for the best practice and benchmarking, exchange of expertise and learnings, and to explore various ways uh, to implement UNCAC, which uh, uh, includes strategies, plans, advancing international cooperation uh, and, and uh, against corruption. IACA has held various annual conferences and will continue to do so uh, worldwide, held in African region, uh, namely the fifth conference was held in Morocco in 2011. Various training seminars and programs have been provided by IACA to anti-corruption authorities since 2007, and we would like to continue to do that. IACA seeks to leverage on the training efforts already achieved in the regions such as SADC. As I indicated, we chair the SADC subcommittee where standard curriculums have, be, have been developed and other uh, 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 training initiatives. Both IACA, uh, so, so the, the, next, the next few slides uh, indicate that there's, there's also an association that you may be aware of in Africa, which is the African Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities, right? I was talking about the international one. There's an African one, and we'd like to foster uh, collaboration with, with, the, with the African one as well. There's a meeting coming up in Bujumbura, I think in June or July. So colleagues, be aware of that, so that we can all foster all of these collaborations. So uh, this slide really just talks about the collaboration uh, with, uh, with ARCA, uh, the, African, the African chapter. I will not go... Uh, in details on that one. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is still the collaboration with EACA. It's similar collaboration that we want to forge uh, with, Commonwealth, with Commonwealth Africa. Next slide. Um, just doing this in the interest of time, you will read, you will read through. So all of, all, of, uh, all of what we have said, colleagues, uh, is that uh, uh, this is the uh, association uh, that we are part of as, as African states. So um, we, we really would like us uh, to participate and all of you get the opportunity uh, to, be, to be part of this association so that, as I repeat, so that as an African continent we are able to influence the policies and directions of anti-corruption measures worldwide. And of course, foster and craft collaboration uh, uh, methods and also foster uh, uh, participation and, uh, and, and partnerships. So, so for, for, for more information, uh, you are obviously welcome to, if you go to the next slide, that I've got the, the contact details and the emails. Uh, and, and the next slide uh, just it gives you that if you need more information, uh, you, can, you can access us uh, on the website. This, this presentation uh, will be left with you. You're welcome to contact us at any point. Dr. Uh, Dr. Koranteng, thank you very much. Thank you for that elaborate uh, presentation. Uh, without much ado, I think we will open up. Perhaps uh, uh, questions and, 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 uh, and comments can be invited at this moment. Yes. My question, uh, dear brother, is uh, there were those, uh, after the inception of this uh, association, there were those uh, people who served in the executive uh, uh, committee. Uh, I want to believe that uh, uh, Namibia, here present, Noah, is one of them. And uh, I'm also one of them. But of course, as time progressed, uh, things fell between the cracks, where we lost uh, touch with the association. 
but uh, I'm aware that um, uh, in 2010, I think uh, uh, Noah would uh, uh, remember, uh, those members who served in the executive committee were bestowed with uh, an honorary uh, membership. So I just wanted to find out uh, what is the status of that uh, membership. Uh, can it be resuscitated? And if it is resuscitated, how do we go about it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Ande Matibi. I want to join your children and this congregation to wish you a, a happy birthday, a personal happy birthday. Um, for, yes, you, you, you missed a we, we sang happy birthday to him. <laughs> to wish you a happy birthday. He's just 34 years old. And I wanted to also congratulate you on your uh, status as a vice president. Is it vice chairman, vice president of uh, that association, of the association? My question, and I think you even mentioned it, but I missed it, is how. Ayaka relates with the United Nations Conference. Because I think you said somewhere that it is intended, to, it was created to implement. Did I hear right? Or if, you, if I didn't. But I want you to please further explain the relationship between the International Association of anti-corruption agencies, IACA, and the United Nations Conference Against Corruption, how they relate and how they support each other. Um, that's my question, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and um, the happy birthdays are in order. I'm just wondering about the number of associations that we have to deal with and the cost implications for underfunded institutions. Uh, I think that the majority of um, institutions say they are not well funded, adequately well funded. And then sometimes the pressure about forging common agenda um, this is also very important. So there is this International Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities. There is necessarily the need for an African Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities. There are some regional versions. There's a regional version in West Africa. I'm sure there are possibly regional versions elsewhere in other parts of Africa. There is the Commonwealth one. Who knows which other one will spring up tomorrow? So it's good to reflect about the, the connections, OK? And about building um, a common agenda. Because sometimes it turns out that what is of paramount importance to one uh, association is not to another association. And we have to take back things, and you know, you have to integrate them into global agenda. I'm trying to make up my mind, maybe because of these similarities in acronyms. I've never seen any activity by uh, the IACA in, say, any conference of state parties, UNCAC conference of state parties, like a side event, something to make an impression. Um, so I'm just wondering how we tie all of this together. Uh, you didn't say anything about how, what, what are the cost implications. Uh, don't forget that. For meetings, thank God for virtual uh, meetings these days. They help to reduce what would have been the almost elimination of some, of some countries from participating because they just can't afford it. Um, so there are the opportunities for virtual interaction and all that, and that's very good. So I'm just wondering if you can close the gaps about at least we should reflect on, on how we build and what we prioritize and how you deal with you know these different interest issues and all that. Thank you. 
Perhaps we can answer those three. Okay, thank you very much for, for, those, uh, for those questions. Um, I'd like to start off with the question relating to those who served in the committee. Uh, my colleagues from Botswana and Namibia, uh, they did mention that uh, they, they were members of this uh, association and they were actually even granted uh, honorary membership. Of course, all we could do, because we, we really just uh, uh, became members uh, now recently, all we'll do is to really take this up uh, with, the, with the association, uh, look back and check uh, what became of that honorary, uh, honorary membership, if it was comfort, and then how is it that it can be resuscitated. Uh, so I, I will definitely do that, and you are welcome to keep in touch with me. I will table it, uh, of course, uh, with, our, with our African colleagues, and then also at the International uh, Association. The relationship between IACA and UNCAC, I think that's a point. By the way, thank you for all the messages and thank you for the best messages. Um, the, the UNCAC, in fact, United Nations Office on Drugs um, uh, uh, and Crime, is actually uh, an observer in the, in, in the IACA. So they sit in there simply from the point of view of forging out a collaboration. Uh, so as, as, as correctly pointed out, um, it doesn't replace, and it will never. Sorry. Okay. That it will, of course, never seek to replace the conferences of uh, of UNCAC. Uh, so, so IACA will have its own conferences, its own seminars, its own training events. But of course, there's a collaboration, and we'll structure it such that uh, it takes into account uh, what the programs of UNCAC us are, uh, and my colleague. Uh, uh, you're welcome to, to, to comment uh, as well. Um, uh, the, the very, very good question around the number of associations. Uh, and, 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 and of course, uh, you know, for, for purposes of being efficient, we will need to ensure that all of these associations are structured such that they make the appropriate impact. And how do we do that? Uh, we, will have, we will have to ensure that, and I think you've sketched it out appropriately, right? Uh, we've got the IACA, which is the international part, and then the African part and the regional part. So all of this, colleagues, my, it's my view, and I think uh, 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 it will be shared, is such that uh, uh, from ground up, uh, when we really uh, uh, determine the needs for example, the training needs, ground up, regional, uh, continental, and international, we should ensure, Af and ultimately to the, uh, the anti-corruption authorities, we should ensure that all of those collaborations are structured, structured such that you are able, you are able to see connectivity and continuity of thoughts uh, so that we ultimately make the appropriate, uh, the appropriate impact. Uh, as you can see, this association has been around for, for quite a long time. Uh, as my colleague uh, uh, indicated, that somewhere, somehow, it looks like there was a bit of, uh, uh, I don't want to say a lull, uh, but, uh, but, but, but uh, I think uh, 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 we would like to make sure, uh, because now there's really just renewed uh, uh, determination. But I really take your point, and these points should also just be raised at the upcoming general meeting of the African Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities, uh, so that we forge that structured approach and, and just, may, just be sure what is it that we want to achieve uh, with all of these associations and be able to report back on a, on a regular basis so that you can see uh, uh, the, the, impact, the impact of those. From the cost implications, in fact, at the last exco and my colleague can confirm that. Uh, at the last Exco, it was uh, taken up that there are no cost implications to join. Uh, 
there's, there, there, there's no, there, there, there's no uh, subscriptions you know, at, at the moment. Of course, it might change going forward. But at the moment, uh, uh, you, you, you're really welcome uh, to, to be a member, no cost implications, and your needs will be considered uh, as much as all others who are members will be considered. But as I say, uh, it's on the table, it might, it might uh, change going forward. Uh, never seen participation at, uh, for example, the, the COSP uh, or the UNCAC. Uh, that, is our, that is our determination going forward, that uh, uh, as we forge this structured relation with other associations, including UNCAC, that we should definitely continue to participate at Congress of State Parties or any other, uh, or any other events hosted by, by, um, by, by UNCAC. Oh, thank, okay. th thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to say a word about funding. Because uh, once I had the opportunity to assist uh, at the beginning of this ICA, we were in China. I was talking about that with me, Mr. Noah yesterday. Because at the beginning, we had the impression that China, China was one who was the only bringing fundings because all our trip was supported by China. And now on, I learned that the time being, it was uh, the Secretary General of the Communist Party of China who was leading it. And it shifted from China to Hong Kong. We are in the same zone of, of influence. What else I want to say is that it's a question of influence. And for now, we are not being asking to bring anything, but I'm not sure it's going to last. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, that, for that comment. Um, as I earlier said, we've come to the end of this session. And uh, at this juncture, I wish to hand over to Dr. Roger Corentin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zambia, for, the, for chairing this. I was just making sure that I've gotten it right. Um, I think Prof's uh, question is quite um, relevant. Uh, just I want to say some few things about that, about the multiplicity of associations uh, on the continent and around the world. The, Anti-corruption space is crowded with all types of association. And some are quite active, some are dormant, some are... And each of them also have some financial implication. I was talking to one of the heads here, and he said that his, uh, his uh, organization pay 16, one six, 16 subscription fees on that space. 16. Of course, they have other... That, that organization has where about three has. I'm talking about uh, us, um, Shraj in Ghana. So there's the financial implications are quite uh, huge. Uh, so yes, it's something that we need to consider. Uh, looking at what benefits you can get from joining the association. We should avoid duplication um, and, and all that. So yes, I think that question is relevant, including our own Commonwealth. The only difference is that the Commonwealth one is very unique because it's the only association that we don't need to have interpreta interpreters. We all come from the same. So we focus as a family. So that's make our unit. Apart from us, everywhere you go, you have to have interpreters, different languages, and it, make, it makes the whole thing a little... Anyway, so I just wanted to note that, yes, the anti-corruption space it's crowded. And it's crowded because maybe it is one of the most important uh, issues confronting human beings, humankind, not only on the continent, but everywhere else. And corruption is a big issue. Um, the question was asked before this association, before these international organizations, um, why is that corruption has not been dealt with? Uh, if you look at all the international organizations, the one who's going to present uh, 
Transparency International, their main aim is to reduce corruption ever since they set it up. And the question is that, have you reduced corruption? You haven't done much. So, but I like the prof point he made, that it's like you were saying that education is expensive. If education is expensive, try illiteracy and see. So that is the point. If we think the associations and all these anti-corruption areas are not, I mean, organizations are not important, you take them out from the world and see how corruption will be, you know. So you have to look at with it or without and see which one will be more expensive. Without much ado, I will call upon South Africa again, use the chair. So to step forward, um, and then I'll call upon Transparency International. Um, there is supposed to be Paul uh, Banoba, but he's he being represented by Transparency International here. I didn't catch the name properly, but he will introduce himself properly. Um, he has been around for a long time. So please step out and be on the on the on the on the seats upstage here. Um, so you, you should have some two minutes to introduce yourself, since both of you are new to each other. Um, whilst we wait for you to take over, so uh, Chair Advocate Motibi, I will hand over to you if we are ready. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quaranteng, uh, for the opportunity for us to chair this uh, session. <clears throat> the topic of the session, colleagues, as you can see, is anti-corruption progress in, in Africa. Uh, what, a, what a good alignment uh, with the with the discussion we had earlier on. Uh, it's really my pleasure uh, to welcome on stage uh, Mr. Uh, Mupigani uh, Poline, Executive uh, Director uh, of uh, uh, Transparency Inter International. Mr. Apolline uh, Mupigani is a Rwandan national, national. He holds a master's degree in business administration and majored in management from Neuchâtel University in Switzerland and a postgraduate diploma in international projects management of applied uh, at the University of Western of Switzerland. He has more than 20 years of professional experience, both in private and non-governmental institutions, dating from 2007. Mr. Apollinaire works with Transparency International Movement and is executive director of the Rwandan chapter uh, since April 2009. Mr. Apolline is currently a member of the Transparency International Strategy 2030 Task Force. He successfully completed a number of trainings, including governance and development, measuring corruption and governance, e-procurement, leadership, good public financial management in key sectors, to name just but the few. Now, under his leadership as Executive Director of Transparency International Rwanda, in partnership with the development partners, namely uh, the German uh, development through DGG program, Mr. Apollinaire spearheaded successfully a number of 
projects aiming at preventing and fighting corruption in Rwanda, but also at regional level, ranging from promoting citizens' part participation in public projects, prom promoting bottom accountability, access to justice for the vulnerable groups through its ALACS and triple C's. Uh, hopefully, you can probably uncode these codes when you speak. Social protection programs, public financial management, analysis of Auditor General reports, monitoring climate change funded projects, to name but those few projects. Colleagues, this is a man with a wealth of experience, well qualified, and we really look forward uh, to hearing from you. Uh, I hand over to Mr. Mo Pigani Apolline, over to you, sir. Thank you, moderator, for such introduction to the audience. Uh, Honorable Chief Ombudsperson, the hosts of this conference, Honorable Head of anti-corruption agencies in Africa, here present, Dr. Korantek, who is coordinating the of our activities and who invited Transparency International to be part of this uh, uh, high-level gathering of anti-corruption uh, agencies. As introduced by the moderator, I stand here as uh, Executive Director of Transparency International Rwanda, but as you saw on the, the agenda, it's your support to be our regional coordinator, uh, Paul Banoba, uh, based in Berlin, who could not join us in this uh, gathering, but asked me to replace him. But as we are working as a, a network, I think we share the knowledge is uh, equally shared, but of course, when you replace, you replace. You are not, it's not uh, the same person, but I try. So, as it's, uh, it was requested to TI to share an expert assessment on anti-corruption progress in Africa, uh, I think the basis of my contribution or the contribution of Transparency International is uh, on the uh, various report published by our movement. But to start, I want to give you an overview on our movement. Transparency International as a global movement was created in uh, 1993. And uh, so far, uh, the movement is present in more than 100 countries. And in Africa, Transparency International is present in uh, 28 countries, as you could see on the map uh, in front of you. The, our wish is to be present in all countries, but uh, it's, 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 there are some uh, prerequisite to be part of Transparency International uh, coalition. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's built on, on, on the local NGOs, uh, who adhere to the movement uh, values and, 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 and uh, mission. And sometimes this, some pre uh, requisites are not uh, fulfilled. This is why it uh, takes some time to make sure to, to have a uh, reliable partner in all countries uh, in Africa. And uh, of course, here in Rwanda, we have the national chapter represented by, uh, known as Transparency International Rwanda. Uh, the, the, the expert assessment or on anti-corruption progress or the survey I want to share with you, it's uh, uh, the, the Corruption Perception Index, which is very known globally and in Africa. And sometimes this uh, survey uh, is criticized by some expert. But uh, I think what is important is to see, to look the best, the outcomes, some key outcomes or, or impact of the CPI. 
The CPI uh, was introduced, Corruption Perception Index was uh, first of all published in 1995. And uh, of course, along these uh, years, it's, uh, it has the merit to bring on high level of the anti-corruption actors uh, the, to, to, to bring the discussion at the high level on, on the, uh, the level of, of corruption. And the CPI ranks countries and territories on the level of corruption in the public institutions. It focuses mostly on public uh, institutions. When we look to the Africa, we are seeing some uh, countries which are really trying to, to, do, to do well, the six best least countries in Africa. As you could see, we are from the CPI uh, 2021, Seychelles emerged as the least corrupt country in Africa, and uh, followed by Cap Verde, Botswana. Botswana used to be the first. Probably if there is a representative of Botswana here could uh, share with us what the reason behind this decrease. Uh, Mauritius, Rwanda, and, and uh, Namibia. Those are the least, uh, those are the six least corrupted, perceived least corrupted countries in our, uh, on our continent. When we, we look to the trend, there are some countries which made tremendous improvement. And uh, here we, we are comparing some uh, two years when we look to 2012, uh, since 2012 and uh, 2020. Senegal emerged as one best performer in terms of improving its, uh, its squaring. As in 2012, Senegal was, uh, was scored 36, when 2020 it improved its score to uh, 45. Uh, the same applied to Ethiopia and, uh, uh, and Cote d'Ivoire. On the other hand, the other countries which somehow uh, decrease their, their squaring or how the citizens or experts see the effort, anti-corruption efforts, and those include Malawi, uh, which decreased from uh, 37 to 37 uh, uh, points down, Liberia, Madagascar, and, uh, and uh, Mozambique, and, uh, and Congo. When we compare 2014 to 2020, we see other countries, uh, for example, Angola improved. On the other hand, Zambia decreased uh, its score. Looking to uh, another comparison, 2015 to uh, 2020, again we see a country uh, like Tanzania, which really sh is showing a good uh, positive trend, uh, and it's uh, even uh, you'll see another report known as a Global Corruption Barometer. It shows that uh, there is a positive trend uh, in Tanzania in uh, preventing and fighting corruption, while uh, on the other hand we are seeing uh, a decrease uh, on. Uh, for example, uh, on uh, uh, the country like Liberia. When we talk about a decrease or increase, this is, uh, though we are saying that it's a perception-based uh, scoring, but uh, it's an opinion of, of, of experts who are visiting uh, the country, who are engaging with the country. And this is based on the, some actions our countries are taking, a kind of uh, message we are sending outside in terms of preventing and, and, and fighting uh, corruption in, in our country. And this is how it, uh, it, it, it affects or it's uh, re uh, reflected on, on the uh, CPI scoring. And uh, of course, uh, again, when we try to, to compare the scoring on 2012 uh, to 2021, we see again some countries, especially Seychelles, Seychelles showed a really uh, great progress as it's 2012 it had uh, uh, 52 score and now he's uh, among the best performer at continental level and even uh, global level, which is uh, commendable uh, progress. Uh, probably 
in this uh, gathering, such uh, peer learning, experience sharing could, uh, uh, could uh, emulate uh, reforms or best practices in the fight against corruption. We are seeing a decrease on Botswana. I think if Botswana, they are here, they could uh, tell us what's the problem, but uh, when there is some restriction or some uh, in, on, on some uh, anti-corruption laws or any other action uh, uh, limiting accountability, it's reflected outside, even though uh, citizens are not probably affected by this uh, corruption, but we are seeing that Botswana decreased in its uh, uh, scoring. Uh, on the other hand, we are seeing some country, uh, other countries progressing positively, uh, namely Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, and uh, of course uh, Angola, uh, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. And Tanzania comes uh, again in another, in another report, uh, which is uh, known as the Global Corruption Barometer. This is uh, a citizen-based uh, survey. Uh, which is conducted by Transparency International. And uh, we are seeing, if we do a kind of comparison, you see that uh, in Tanzania, uh, it's in 2015, only 37% uh, of citizens uh, thought government is doing enough to tackle corruption. But uh, the same survey in 2019 shows this tremendous uh, perception change positively. Uh, to 71%. So there is a kind of uh, correlation of, of the, the data. The Sierra one, again, it's, uh, it shows a great improvement on, uh, on this uh, uh, global corruption barometer and so forth. While in, on the other hand, uh, there are some countries uh, who are perceived that the efforts in fighting corruption is really very low, it's decreasing. And the example is Gabon where, for example, 2015, the perception was on 86%, and the 2019, it's the bad, the uh, negative perception in uh, fighting corruption increased to 87%, and we can look to other, other countries uh, uh, again. So, there another indicator that we try to measure in a global corruption barometer is to see if uh, corruption is increasing, uh, the prevalence of corruption is increasing. In uh, 35 African countries surveyed, the majority of citizens think, observe a level of increased cor uh, increasing of corruption. And this is, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, shown uh, on various uh, countries where corruption, uh, the perception of increase, increasing of corruption is very high, from 85% to 49% uh, the, on various uh, uh, countries which are assessed. And when we look to uh, the institutions, there are some key institutions where uh, it's, there is a need of uh, increasing efforts. Unfortunately, some of them are part of the anti-corruption uh, agencies or pillars of integrity. Uh, this is probably discouraging to see those who are supposed to be the, the, the pioneer in the fight against corruption and coming from the general public uh, opinion that they are, uh, the prevalence or perception of corruption is, 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 uh, is, is high. But as we are in Rwanda, let's uh, see uh, the case of Rwanda, the experience of Rwanda. Uh, for sure, there are various uh, talks or uh, experience shared uh, on case of Rwanda, but in Rwanda, the success story is here in Rwanda. It's, it's based on the high political will. I personally, as uh, civil society, I am part of this, uh, how? act as not public institution, but outside a watchdog actor. But uh, compared to our colleagues in the uh, continent or in the region, we are seeing, we are seeing really a very uh, great uh, political will 
reflected in uh, tangible action. But political will is not enough. There I'm quoting, uh, we quote His Excellency the President of the Republic. Uh, the political will is not enough. It needs to be supported by other instruments. And the Rwanda, I think uh, uh, the experience for sure, the Office of Ombudsman here shared with you the uh, Rwandan experience. But I want really to emphasize the importance of a uh, robust uh, legal framework. I remember the law we used to have, anti-corruption law here in Rwanda, had many gaps in terms of fighting corruption. Just to give an example, when uh, someone uh, was uh, involved in corruption uh, uh, and uh, was reporting it, he was considered as corrupt person and punished equally with the, 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 the initiator of corruption. And this law has been uh, reformed. Now if you report, let's say if you, you, are, obliged to pay, you are obliged to pay a bribe, uh, but you, you, take, uh, you report immediately, even if you paid. Let's say they are, uh, you, you want to travel to the airport and to get your passport, you are, uh, they're asking you uh, to pay a bribe. You, have, you don't have any choice. You have to pay to travel. But if you report immediately, you, you are not uh, prosecuted. You, you are innocent. The, the uh, organ will prosecute those, the one who received, not you, because you reported. But before, you were as well considered as corrupt person. Uh, the other important reform is uh, the prescription of corrupt, uh, corruption crime. This was introduced as well as uh, one deter uh, deterrent uh, provision because sometimes people were uh, embezzling uh, public funds and uh, leave the country for five years and after they come back and enjoy the, the results of the, 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 their corruption behavior. Now, as long as you are not uh, facing the court, you end by facing the court. So those laws are supporting really to uh, fight uh, corruption, and uh, this is uh, reflected on uh, Rwandan Corruption uh, Perception Index ranking, which really uh, kept improving, uh, increasing the, the score, though we are seeing a kind of decrease uh, in 2020, 2021. Compared to the, our region, we are seeing that, again, corruption is still uh, prevalent at the high level in the East African community. Uh, for sure, the representative of East, East African community here present would uh, have a separate discussion as we are interconnected uh, and corruption does not have uh, frontiers. Mm -hmm. So if Rwanda is fighting corruption uh, and uh, in our neighbors there is high level of corruption, for sure there will be a free trade, free uh, exchange of these uh, bad practices. For, as a civil society, we are contributing, we, we think we are part of this uh, uh, fight or this uh, uh, positive change. And at here Rwanda, we produce a report known as the Rwanda Bribery Index on an annual basis, which criticizes institutions uh, who is more uh, perceived uh, corrupted. But the positive message is that now the public institutions are taking is, it as a positive contribution and action are initiated. And the results is we are making, we made an analysis to see the trend before we started to publish the, uh, the Rwanda Bribery Index, <coughs> the ranking on CPI, and uh, the current situation. Of course, we, ha we still have a long journey to, to go. Uh, but though we are, we, 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 we are appreciating, we are celebrating the progress in general, uh, though we see some uh, level, high level of corruption in some uh, African countries, there are m some challenges that need to be, uh, to be uh, addressed. Reporting is still very, very low, a very low uh, on continental level, even beyond. Uh, witnesses of corruption, whistleblowers, are refraining to report due to many reasons. Even here in Rwanda, we have very low level of reporting. And as anti-corruption uh, actors, it's difficult to fight corruption to lead to the results if we, you don't have information. And uh, this is also reflected in uh, one regional report produced by Transparency International East African, uh, known as uh, East African Bribery Index, 
we see that the level of reporting is uh, very, very low. And the, the reasons uh, they are saying, fear of, 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 of uh, intimidation, uh, they are part of the, they are gaining in this process, and other reasons that uh, the presentation it will be shared. But I think as anti-corruption actors, we need to find solution on this uh, reporting uh, level, which is very low. Here in Rwanda, you see the reasons why uh, the witnesses or whistleblowers are not reporting. The success factors here in Rwanda, I think there is the collaboration. I participated in some international conferences where we are civil society, private sector, public institution, and there is still a kind of uh, uh, how not to trust between civil society and uh, public institutions. But we are partners. We have the same, the same enemy. The enemy is the corruption. So this is a good example here in Rwanda, where at here Rwanda we are really, we are enjoying uh, such uh, positive uh, collaboration with public institutions. We have an MOU with Ambusuman. We have a MOU with the Rwanda National Police, the prosecution. We are working together, we share information when it comes, when it comes to fight corruption. So I think this is, should be promoted at the continental level to make sure that uh, the, the, this, uh, uh, same, this uh, uh, joint enemy is, is really defeated, and it can't be defeated if you are fighting in an isolated manner. I think this is uh, one of the key message. And of course, ICT is very, very important. As a civil society here in Rwanda, here in Rwanda we have uh, uh, online reporting tools, but for sure uh, your partner's uh, institution has shared the experience. We have an online tool known as uh, IFATE, and of course, we appreciate the other online tools uh, developed by uh, government institutions, namely Supreme Court, the Office of Ombudsman, and other public institutions uh, involved, uh, engaged in fighting corruption in our country. I thank you for your attention. No, thank you, sir. Um, a very um, taking into account uh, some of the uh, points, some of the points you've made, and shall I say congratulations to those uh, countries, our colleagues who have really shown to be doing well from the perception index, and those that are indicated or names not appearing on those who are doing well, we shall not despair. We will continue to make sure that uh, we do our best. Uh, let, me, let me open up uh, any, any questions uh, to, to our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Quarantine, I don't want to really be a bad chair. Uh, we've got until uh, on the program until 10. Yeah. Uh, so colleagues, we've got exactly 16 minutes uh, to field the questions and and responses. Yeah. Uh, uh, our colleague from Botswana. Well, thank you, Chair. And let me also thank the presenter for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I was not going to uh, make any intervention, but uh, I think the the presenter has invited me to make a comment <laughs> so that I can share uh, with colleagues here why, you lost your post. Why, we've, why we lost our position to uh, Seychelles and we congratulate the Seychelles for doing a wonderful job. <laughs> you were tired of yeah, if, yeah, if you look at uh, the, the ratings, there was a point where we stagnated at uh, 6.1 up to 2019. Um, at that point, Mauritius, I mean Seychelles, they increased their ratings. And that is where they overtook us. So we are looking at the current ratings 
Yes, we have dropped by five points. And we are critically examining uh, the data source that was used to uh, do the evaluation. Uh, there was one data source that was introduced for the first time where we were rated, and that is where we lost our points. So in other words, you cannot say that uh, when you look at uh, the data source that was uh, uh, used uh, previously and the current, you cannot say that uh, there was like uh, to like that was used. But we are not complaining. We are taking that uh, with uh, all the positives or positivities that uh, we can because uh, that's an indication that we are sick. <laughs> and if you are sick and you don't admit that you are sick, there is no way that you can get healed. So that is how we take it. And also, we are learning from uh, those uh, ratings. What do they mean? They are challenging us. What is it that uh, we need to do that we have not done in the past? What is it that uh, made us to stagnate? What is it that uh, uh, our colleagues did uh, that uh, they uh, did very well? So we are taking it uh, with all the positivities that you can think of. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, colleague. Uh, next, next question. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, let me also thank the presenter for the elaborate presentation. Uh, it is really very nice to hear from you on what Transparency International is doing. You know, sometimes we think that how Transparency International does its work is not transparent, but I hope it will be more transparent as we go in future. Uh, my, my question or observation is on the figures presented vis-a-vis -vis the election year. In many elections, many countries in Africa, parties campaign on corruption. They say we will fight corruption. And a picture is given to the electorate that corruption is high in the country. So when you go ask people about corruption, the response is likely to be it is high in that year when parties are campaigning. And come when a new government has come in, you find that there is a lot of people that are reporting corruption that happened in the previous government. And you receive a lot of cases. But when you analyze the cases themselves, you find that they are talking about corruption that happened maybe three years before when the Transparency International figures were indicating that corruption was okay. There wasn't much corruption. But after the election, you find that there was corruption in those years when TI was saying things are okay. Now, um, how do you moderate to, so that the figures are actually talking about corruption that is happening, but merely that people are now free to, uh, to express themselves on corruption issues. Thank you. Uh, can I just take the, the probably one or two last hands and then give, give the presenter the opportunity to respond? Uh, time permitting, we'll have the next round. Uh, we really want to keep to time. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Mkungo, and then uh, our colleague from Uganda. Okay, thank you, moderator. Thank you for the insight presentation. I think from today, I will take your number and your contacts. I will be on your case to ask you what, how can you, how can we improve? My question is that how can you advise us as the delegates on how can we, how can we improve really? Because like in South Africa, I was tasked to follow up with Transparency International, what, how, what can we do to improve the ratings? And uh, the question I was referred to 
the Corruption Watch, which is the entry point for transparency in international, that you can talk to your organization, which is Corrup Corruption Watch, or in how can you improve. But there's nothing much that we also get seeing on how can, we are doing so much in, in the country as to fight corruption. But our ratings, they are not I improving as like this year in 2021, we are still at the same level, no movement. But there's so much that we are doing. How can you advise going forward? What needs to be done to, Im to, to improve? Thank you. Thank you. And then the next question, uh, this lady here. Um, thank you uh, very much, um, presenter. Very interesting presentation. I am I'm thinking that uh, in every evaluation, or when we are thinking about corruption, we've often said uh, it's very important to have political will to fight corruption, strong legislation, and maybe also the vibrance of the anti-corruption agencies or authorities. And where they are doing very well, we see political will, strong political will. And in all of our countries, we see strong legislation, which has made even stronger legislation. What I want to ask, or even to, uh, to, to, cons to throw for us to consider how much more can the anti-corruption agencies add to the equation to improve it? Because we, we throw it at um, political will. But what about that percentage of ourselves? How much more can we have added or not added or removed from the war by our own act, act, uh, it's called activism or, or, or vibrance? Um, so I really wanted to add the, the component because I was thinking about my, my own country. And I'm saying, OK, we're not doing so well. But who is supposed to do well? Because I have all the laws I need, maybe I am the one who is not working hard. So I think we need also to, uh, instead of looking at everybody else who is not doing what they're not supposed to do, or the laws, we should also look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves, our competence, our capacities, our motivation, our drive, how much more of that adds or takes away from the equation in our own countries. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, uh, I'm looking at the time. Uh, Ca it can I just add a little bit, points. Mr. Chairman? And I'll be very brief. Um, we, have been, we have done it in the past, and I think Mr. Anua will, tell, will bear me witness. I think it was in Ghana, yes. where we brought the actual people, five of them, who were doing this transparency uh, perception index, the data collectors, how they analyze it, and they were all there in Ghana. And the same reaction, and I'm sure maybe Mr. Nua can even say it better than I do, because he was leading the onslaught <laughs> <laughs> to, to these people. But I think for me, the, the, the takeaway point is this. When you are using different data sources, you are using four for one country, you are using 13 for another country, and then you are comparing. I think you are not comparing the same thing. So why don't they use, if it's, they think the, the, top, the four is the one they can use, they, they use only the four across. That would be a fair assessment. But I think I would not, we're still going to work and bring them next time, maybe in Seychelles when we are meeting there. <laughs> well, I would, I'll work so hard, I'll go to Berlin and bring them. The yeah. Because yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Let's take the one last hand and then the last hand this side, colleagues. Then, then we close and give the presenter the opportunity. Uh, thank you. For the presenter from Transparency, 
I want to give you an analogy. The way you assess is like you take two houses. You want to check which house is the cleanest. Then you agree, one house you'll just check the sitting room, and the other house you'll go up to the backyard, toilets, everything. Then you say, this is the dirtiest house. You have Middle Eastern countries, which are very autocratic. You cannot even dare to investigate or even interview a minister, and you rank them at the top that they are very accountable. Some of those Middle East countries are the ones that are stashing illicit fund from corruption. But you find those countries, you have put them at the top as the most transparent. So we know we have a problem in Africa, but we don't agree with your rating. It is totally wrong. Can I? Uh, my colleague, uh, the, the last hand this side, please. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Hadi from uh, PTF. Now, all okay. my speakers sorry, sorry, before sorry, me have already made the, uh, most of the points I tried to make, so I would just like to agree with you. I, I think the methodology does not allow for cross-country comparison. It does not allow for comparison across time, and it certainly does not allow for comparison across countries across time. Um, I would like to, and I've been studying the CPI for 20 years now, since 2003, and I am a big supporter of TI, so please don't get me wrong, I'm a member of the German chapter, um, but I ask all of you um, what I said yesterday, please don't use it to assess your country's corruption level, please don't use it to assess your agency's performance, and I would like to invite you and ask Dr. Roger, if you give me 20 minutes, I would like to uh, discuss the methodology. It's not very complicated. If you look at two different documents, you will understand, and I think then we can all stop chasing CPI scores. So, thank you. Thank you. Th uh, th thank you, colleagues. I think uh, uh, at this stage, uh, we'll give the presenter to present, but one thing for sure, as my colleague would attest, when he presents later on. This is one exercise. When, when you prepare for the exam, the previous exam papers don't, don't help. Uh, uh, they, they, it, it's really difficult uh, to know how is it that you will be assessed. But anyway, uh, uh, we hand over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, and thanks to the very engaged feedback from the, the, the participants. Uh, I think this shows how difficult the topic we are working on. Corruption, it's not material. It's, 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 it's not tangible, difficult to, to have evidence. And it's not uh, an, an exact science. It's not mathematics. So I would like to ask anyone here who is participating and uh, ask your experience in your country. If you say you don't trust, let's, your perception. Is corruption decreasing in your country? Increasing or stable? Because though I'm not, I'm not there to, to defend uh, the CPI, it has its uh, weaknesses, but I think it has uh, as well some merits. CPI is a, is, a, is, a, is a survey of other survey. It's an aggregate. It, 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 it uses other source of data. So if the World Bank comes or Africa, New, uh, Africa Development Bank comes, Economy, uh, where the economic forums comes to measure uh, doing business in your country, uh, the, the transparency and accountability in your country, and of course they find some weaknesses. How, how can we say that uh, all those, of course I agree that the sources are not similar, and of course TI to, to limit or to, to decrease the, the, the errors, at least three sources have to be considered from the 13 uh, sources that are used where Tier Rwanda, uh, where Transparency International uh, correct the, the data from recognized institutions. So I think what is important, it's not to, to say, no, I don't trust, but look on your specific environment. Corruption, is it increasing, decreasing? And uh, this is why even I, I started by, by quoting His Excellency the President. He said, we are not fighting corruption to be praised. We are fighting corruption to, for our own benefit. And it's, it comes really at the opportune time and, 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 and moments 
in this, uh, this forum. Okay. So this uh, CPI is even triangulated by the Global Corruption Barometer. This is experience-based uh, survey. And here in Rwanda, we are conducting what's known Rwanda Bribe Index. And I think as anti-corruption actors, of course, it's very important to look to what is going on. But the, the key message is, how is the situation in, in, in our respective countries? How are we doing ourselves? Okay, so uh, to, and this probably respond to other questions because it was, uh, it was uh, some concerns on, on, on the, 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 the ranking data source, uh, but there is one who asked what to do to improve. I think fighting corruption can't be done in an isolated manner. No, no single institution can pretend to succeed fighting corruption. It's a collective action. It's required to involve the citizens. It's because they are the one, the victims, and of course the one who can be involved in corruption. Please think to the methods, the way that can bring the critical mass of anti-corruption fighters. And this is probably what we are trying as a CSO and of course in Rwanda to mobilize citizens to report. The challenge is still the law reporting, but I think if political will is there, if uh, laws are really strong enough, institutions, we need the collective, uh, we need citizen support in this journey. Let me stop here. Thank, thank you. you. No, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. I think uh, the, the, the interests uh, of, of, of the colleagues in this topic is very, very clear. Uh, and thanks, Dr. Koranteng, for, the, for that, I uh, don't know whether to call it undertaking, uh, that uh, in Seychelles we will again revisit this point. And it will be so important that when we do, that uh, we sort of uh, call, really uh, do, do a, a clear look at data-based and, you know, uh, a perception-based uh, yeah. outcomes. Uh, we had yesterday uh, uh, from Christine from the World Bank that data is the next level. But of course, perception also needs to be managed. Uh, but on that way, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, the insights, the education you've given us, the insights, the motivation to do more, uh, and also that, uh, that uh, engaging citizens is very, very important. Uh, fighting corruption is a whole of society approach. We thank you very much for that. Well done. Thank you. A round of applause, please. Give a round of applause to Advocate Motivi for chairing such a emotive, such a emotive um, presentation. In fact, I hope the Transparency International uh, gentleman has not regretted coming. <laughs> has not regretted coming down here. Uh, <laughs> it has always been a very emotive discussion when it comes to this perception. Uh, so yes, uh, we will try and see if, the, if we, I can bring the team again uh, to our next conference, where you see the real, the real faces behind these um, measurements or the perception index. If you push them to the wall, they say, well, it's a perception. So. <laughs> uh, but the forgotten that perception is as is as real as um, you know natural things because the perception people form opinions. People, country surface. The, the countries are blacklisted. Uh, countries are ostracized because of perception, and the perception may be right or wrong. But that is what we work with. Um, I must. I'm not discounting uh, Transparency International effort because to embark on that kind of global ranking is not an easy tax, you know, whatever you look at it. It's a, it can be ethical dilemma uh, going forward. But we we'll reserve our uh, pipe down, and our guns should be, should be silent until we meet them face to face. And they can have also the opportunity to explain their side of, the, of how they do it. So thank you again 
for coming. I hope you have a baptism of fire, but that's all right. <laughs> and our next um, section before we go for tea break, we're going to listen to um, South Africa and Iswatini. And Nigeria EFCC is in the chair. So the chair should, and the, and the panel, uh, the country report presenters should come up and do us the honor. Each of the presenters have 20 minutes. Keep to time. Hmm? Um, each of them have 20 minutes, and we have some questions and answers for maybe 10 minutes. Where is the other person? South Africa? Yeah, and uh, East Watin, yeah, sure. Okay, so um, I will hand over to the chair um, for this session. Uh, I'll try my best to ensure we keep to time, but that also depends on uh, the presenters and those who are going to raise queries on the presentations. Um, I have two gentlemen here. The first on my right is, and I'm going to have problems with them. Um, the pronunciation of the name, I hope you won't be offended. Mine is not better. <laughs> Mafevu Nkatswa is um, of the Anti-Corruption Commission of uh, Iswatini. Is a Deputy Commissioner of Operations. Is Doctor of Business Administration candidate with the University of Namibia. He's got a master's degree in accounting and economics and holds a Bachelor of Commerce in Risk and Project Management. He's got up to 18 years experience on the seat. I called on Mr. Mafevu Nkatswa to take the podium. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, all protocol observed. I will leave my presentation here on a certain anti corruption commission. I don't know if I'm clear or not. Yeah, it's, it's there. The presentation will be on the brief introduction of and the key background of the institution. And then I think we will share one innovation, innovative work that uh, we are Naturally, we are planning to to do it back home. I think it's at, a, at an advanced stage. The, I brought it here because maybe we can have some constructive criticism in terms of implementing it back home. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission uh, of Swatini is, uh, is enacted by the Anti-Corruption Act of 2006. Yes, maybe there are other various agile legislation that we, we use while we are still carrying out our work. More especially, I think, we, the, the recent one is the prevention of organized crime which I think it helped us a lot in terms of before we used the, the conviction-based uh, forfeiture, whereas this new one, it, it provided civil forfeiture. 
or the mandate of the anti-corruption commission is divided into into three where we have to investigate educate and prevent maybe let's just get into the exercise that we we intend doing it back home which is at a, i think it's at an advanced stage in terms of coming up with it where we want to do a national multi-sectoral multimedia commission communication campaign it's a theme which says the united nations against corruption so the theme how do we how do we come up to come up with this this drive back home we threw it from some sources there back home so we used the national development strategy from the country there then we also used the 2010 and 2017 perception surveys in terms of how do people perceive corruption back home yeah <laughs> then uh, of course there's the government strategic roadmap so that's how we, we came up with it in terms of it in terms of that the the main objective of the campaign is to have the citizenship citizens participation to the fight against corruption then obviously if citizens participate we have reduced incidences of corruption we'll have reduced tolerance levels we'll have improved public perceptions in terms of corruption then one would maybe ask how are we going to do this thing so we'll use the multimedia to carry out this exercise and we'll use the billboards in terms of that which are i think some of the digital billboards that would be the carrying out those messages in terms of uh, people letting them know about the issues of corruption also we have posters and pamphlets that will be readily available within almost all institutions both public and private sectors then we will ask some commitment from the head of the institutions in terms of in the form of like a pledge maybe so that they can help us to to come to the party so they may, they will make those commitments in terms of like their institutions if how are they committed in terms of fighting corruption within those different institutions? Because before you will find that most of the the people believe that no, the issue of fighting corruption only rests with the the agency, which I think we think that no, 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 it was not that much helping the country to move forward in terms of fighting the corruption. Okay, maybe there can be those challenges in terms of implementation of this exercise where definitely it will need endorsement in terms of government and the leadership should endorse this exercise and accept it. Then maybe maybe another issue it will be in terms of when we're doing the monitoring and evaluation of the exercise definitely we we'll, we might need some a little bit skillful stuff in terms of that in terms of doing that maybe we might be overwhelmed by the participation of the members of the public so you might find that a lot of people want to contribute in terms of that so we anticipate in terms of that that we might need more human resource in the different fields then the other issue is maybe it, we will have some issues in terms of financing because the anticipation now is that maybe some other institutions will donate in terms of in the implementation of the of the project like we're anticipating that maybe the the newspapers if they come to the party will provide some slots uh, in terms of promoting the campaign and 
I think even television, all those. Then, at the end of the day, we need to have some results in terms of the campaign. What, uh, what do we expect to achieve as a country? So, we want to see citizens standing up against corruption. In terms of that, we might improve corruption perceptions, reduce tolerance levels, bribery tackled by the public itself, and restoration of the prestige of the entire civil service, partnerships, and multi-sector multi stakeholders embracing the anti-corruption agenda as it is. Uh, I think for now I can end here because it's, it's still something that is still coming. It's not that uh, we've already implemented it in terms of that now we can have some reflections in terms of that. But for now, we are still we are on, a way, on a way of that we, we want to launch it and we anticipate launching it at the highest level so that we try to bring more especially the people who are mostly problematic in terms of when you're fighting corruption, you find that almost the three arms of government are fighting. So at least if we can uh, launch it at the highest level so that almost all the three arms will come to the party. Because you might find if we launch it with the executive, maybe the judiciary will say, no, I'm not going there. I won't pass the debate. But when we have the same problem that, oh, maybe some cases maybe in, 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 in the court are, are being sold, like judgments are being sold. So at least if everybody comes to the party, uh, I think for now I can end you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mafebu. It gave us more time than I expected. And um, your, 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 your message is uh, straight on. Your mandate is straight to investigate, to educate, and to prevent. Once you can prevent and educate people, I'm sure that um, you have very little to investigate. And uh, we, we hope that um, your strategic roadmap and government support and leadership will help the fight against corruption in, um, in Iswahitini. The, um, the interesting thing you, you stated here is about pledge of leadership, pledge of commitment by leadership. And I think that is, um, that is tried because um, a lot of people have argued here. Yesterday I was talking with um, one of our brothers and um, he said um, strategy is no longer important in most of the things that we do. What we just need is the person to do the work. That is the leadership. And um, this is very, very, very important when it comes to this pledge of commitment by leadership. Uh, before we take on comments and queries, let me invite our second discussant or presenter uh, from South Africa, Mr. Tulani Nkungo. Mr. Tulani Nkungo is a Chief Risk Officer at the Special Investigation Unit. He holds a BCom degree in accounting, postgraduate diploma in risk management, and a postgraduate diploma in business management. He started his career as a trainee accountant and auditor with the Office of the Auditor General of South Africa, and then moved to different government departments, local government, and state entities holding different positions in audit and risk management. Tulani Nkungo worked at the Transnet Freight Rail as the senior manager risk, risk, driving infrastructure capital project risk for more than six years before joining the Special Investigation Unit in February 2016 as the head of internal risk and governance, where he successfully established the enterprise risk management 
governance and audit units. In November 2018, he was appointed the chief risk officer at the SIU after the restructuring. One of his greatest achievements in the position includes the sector vulnerability risk assessment where the head where the health sector was identified as one of the key vulnerable sectors through corruption risk assessment. This has led to the establishment of the Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum, which was officially launched by the President of the Republic on October 1, 2019, which was also followed by Infrastructure Build Anti-Corruption Forum and Local Government Anti-Corruption Forum. I present to you for his country presentation, Mr. Tulani Nkungo from South Africa. Office of the Chief of Massman, the organizer Dr. Korateng, uh, colleagues at large, all protocol observed. Good morning. Uh, I'm here to um, present the country paper for South Africa on behalf of Special Investigating Unit. Uh, uh, our presentation is based on the projects that we engaged on from 2020 till today that we are wrapping up, which is mostly is talking on the pandemic, on how we have fight the corruption during this pandemic when it started countrywide and in, when it hit our country as well. As well, we're in South Africa as a SIU Special Investigating Unit, we work on the proclamations. The proclamation is when we, when we get the tips or the whistleblowers coming in, they are coming in to announce that there is a corruption where, where they see it. Then from there, we put together the motivation, which goes to the president to proclaim that we can start investigate that corruption in that area. So during the pandemic then is where it started. No, it's not longer moving there. Can assist? I will call continue why they they are assisting to, to move. When when this pandemic starts on the COVID nineteen, we started to look down there where we sleep the was coming in that you are starting to seeing the Range Rovers are being bought, the Ferraris the porches, then the, the proclamation was motivated and then it goes to the president, it was proclaimed for the pro personal protective equipment. And then the risk of corruption was identified in, in this procurement of the PPEs as one of it. Then this, this led to this proclamation called Proclamation R2023 of 2020. Then what measures? that we took going forward and then. Okay. The first one that we took, we first, as, a, as, as we fight corruption together as with all other agencies, there was a, an establishment of the Fusion Center. The Fusion Center we, is where all agencies, they will come together to see that we, so, so that there is no overlap on the mandate and who is doing what, they were all together. This Fujian Center, when the COVID-19 pandemic started and lockdown came into effect on the 26th of March 2020, the President of the Republic of South Africa and His Excellency, Sir Ramaphosa, announced the relief fund and directed government departments, state entities and municipalities to set aside funds to procure the personal protective equipment for employees. The risk, the, when was 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 identified, and then we came with it. And then these measures. Oh, not sure. It looks like, like I'm going back. Yeah, no, I'm fine now. Thank you. Then we adopted this approach of the Fusion Center. When when the Fusion Center is, was established. It is underpinned the following principles. 
is a multi-approach to ensure collective effort, proper integration, effective coordination and collaboration of efforts, core location of human resources, flexibility, agility and operational adaptability, transparency in sharing and exchanging of information, as I mentioned earlier on, accurate and shared identification, targeting entities for investigation, safeguarding the confidentiality and security of sensitive information, intelligence and protection driving investigations. This was the core principles this Virgin Center was formed under. Okay, <clears throat> this Fusion Center, in line with the proposed national anti-corruption strategy of South Africa, a four-pronged approach was adopted, which consists of prevention, detection, investigation, and resolution. What does all this mean then? This means, first, prevention within the scope of the COVID-19, Time frames, the law enforcement focuses prevention on risk identification, conveying information to deter wrongdoing and proactive reporting to enhance detection efforts. Then we move on the in investigation side on the left. We say that it is critical to institute immediate and parallel investigation to fast track any matters and to have a central database for all cases, that is criminal investigations, administrative investigation, maladministration, financial investigations. Then when we detect on the detection on the Fujian Center, the focus is on improving the chances of detecting wrongdoing before it happens, which includes early warning, big data analysis, and short speed sharing of information within the agencies that are fighting corruption. Then on the resolution, ensure efficient and effective referrals and quick response process towards asset recovery and prosecution. This includes prosecution, freezing of assets, and recovery, says as they all as agencies that are fighting corruption within the country. Then before prior to the pandemic in 2018, with the, the SIU, also motivated that we should have a special tribunal re-established, which is the tool that we use to quick recover the funds or freeze the assets or those that are suspect of, re of wrongdoing. The special tribunal is also a big tool that today is giving us much efforts and good result in fighting corruption. Special Tribunal is a bridge by the of South Africa under the Section 21B of the Special Investigation Units and Special Tribunals Act of 1996. The Special Tribunal consists of a judge, including retired judge of the High Court as a, as a tribunal president. Additional members of the tribunal may be appointed in terms of Section 7, Three. Okay, these are the powers of the special tribunal. In of time, I will not go in detail with them, but these are the powers that are being executed by the special tribunal, which is used by the SIU to quick recover and take those that are in wrongdoing. Today, you can say the, the impact that we have with this on the appeals and impact, the establishment of the special tribunal has resulted in an increase of legal outcomes all matters instituted in the special tribunal are case managed by a judge which ensures speed adjudication of matters. To date, 46 matters has been issued in the special tribunal to the value of 6.9 billion rands. Okay, during the COVID-19 pandemic, this is uh, it's very small there, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for that. This, this, this figure is, or diagram is, is showing how much of the COVID-19 that was set aside to, to purchase personal protective equipment for government departments and entities, it was 138 billion. Out of the 188 billion, 14.8 billion is the one that was under investigation by the SIU to say that that were in terms of the corruption, suspect for corruption. 
Then the result of our investigation in fighting this corruption during the pandemic is on the, this the, on the next slide. We're showing there. As estimated, the conduct and investigation, as I said, is 14 billion that we investigated. And then civil lit litigations that, uh, or that we went to court is 2 billion. And the, it's more there. The disciplinaries that, were, that have repaired, referred to entities or departments is 227. To the, to the National Prosecuting Authority, the, we said NPA is 366. Then administrative, the referral, 330. Then it says the other ones are the value. Then down there, the value of actual money recovered, 34 down there. These are the results of what we have managed with this project to make sure that we kept corruption, corruption during the pandemic. Then what have, what have we learned? The lessons learned or investigation, the observations that we now we are sharing with departments, government departments, the entities to prevent the such happening again when we have another pandemic. We have seen that there's a high rise in, in collusion, SEM officials, bid committees, service providers, deviation and emergency procurement abuse because there was a deviation that was announced that the departments and entities can use the deviation to procure the personal protective equipment. This was all abused, inadequate and gaps in the systems and processes, use of transversal contracts not considered, national treasury COVID-19 procurement instructions and guidelines ignored, personal protective equipment service providers predetermined, and some were not registered on the central database. Because uh, at South Africa, we have, at National Treasury, we have a central database of the service providers. So this was also abused. Cover, coating, and splitting of bids to meet delegation thresholds, goods and services supplied were not aligned with CIPC and CSD records, Products supplied did not meet specifications, inflection of prices and overpricing. These were the outcomes that now are being used for the lessons learned and share to say that we avoid the similar situation. That is the project we are on. Then the last one, just the recap. Previous year, last year we presented this as the project. It is ongoing, we are still working on. We, we presented a vulnerable sector assessment that we have conducted, that we have identified the sectors that are prone to corruption. First one was the health sector, followed by the infrastructure built and construction and local government. These three, we have launched the forums in each of these sectors that are working to say that the corruption is being kept and the, the forums are sitting on a quarterly basis, basis in these areas. So this is the project that is ongoing as, as we presented in the previous year and the other year that we are working on the sector approach to cap corruption in the country. Okay, in conclusion, <coughs> for us South Africa, we're saying that the fight against corruption in South Africa is intensified and necessary impact is being made. There is in the multi-sector approach that you are following, which is include civil society, business, government, religious leaders, etc., to, to collaborate to fight corruption. We are using the collaboration approach. There is more focus on ensuring that whistleblowers are adequately protected against threats, which is also another project we're working on to make sure that our whistleblowers, they are protected. Education and awareness initiatives are being implemented to ensure that there is more focus on corruption prevention. I thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Tolani and South Africa have given us um, a special circumstance because um, they have taken on, you know, a distinct uh, subject to check how corruption uh, thrives in some of our societies. Unfortunately, while the pandemic raged, a lot of people were busy making money and then um, smiling to the banks at the expense of their citizens. Um, the measures they have taken are quite innovative. Uh, I think the, 
the fusion center which they had. Most countries all over the world had such centers. But they also had um, their four-pronged approach. And um, of special interest to me, and I think to all of us, was their decision to entrench the special tribunals. Because usually special tribunals are quick fixes to get fast results. And I think um, from the statistics and the records of his presentation, we saw that um, they achieved quite a lot. I think one of the things that we should always pursue, which, which, which uh, some of us have argued back at home, is that uh, we should be fast about um, you know, prosecution or recovery of stolen property. Yesterday, the man from Syria alone uh, said that in three months, he can start the matter and finish it. Why in some cases, we heard of cases that um, have been there for 20, 30 years. Some have been there for 15 years. So I thank the two presenters. And before we go to the question and answer sessions, uh, I would like us to give both of them another round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, the, the floor is open. We are working within time, and I'm sure that in the next um, 15, 16 minutes, we should be done with the question and answer sessions. So I will yield the floor to anybody who has a comment, a question, or an answer, or a clarification to give on any of the issues that have been raised by the two presenters. Thank you. my glasses to see those who are raising their hands. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And let me also thank the presenters for the elaborate presentations. My question would go to South Africa. The COVID-19 issue uh, was also an issue uh, in my own country. One problem that you found out of overpricing was also an issue. You could literally see that most of the items procured in the program were procured at a higher price. But then when we take up the matter, they would say, you advertised, and we as suppliers, we gave tenders our pricing and you chose us. How should you say that is corruption? I don't know how you tackle that one uh, in your case. The second one is uh, where you have found somebody uh, in malpractice, and then you as an agency has taken up the matter. We found that the institution could not carry the normal uh, disciplinary issues on the person. You would say, the matter is in court, then you don't have an authority over me now. Let's wait for the court process to continue. Meanwhile, you find that as you are pursuing the case, but the individual is still earning his pay because the institution that employs him has not taken disciplinary measures. I don't know in your case, do you pursue them concurrently or when a matter is in court, you are also, uh, the institution is also not allowed to be pursuing it parallel. Thank you. Is there any other hand up for a question or comment? Okay. You have the floor. Yes, loud now. Thank you. Okay, on the first question, on the overpricing, most of the cases you find out that there is the person internally who is responsible for 
issuing the tender, they usually collude with the suppliers to accept the overpriced. So that's what most cases that we identify. And then that, that leads to when we get our investigation, we have leads to the referrals, where we have now two referrals. The referral first is the referral to the DC, to the internal staff members. This must go for DC. We, we make those referrals, we identify those cases where there was a collusion and there's evidence that there was a collusion or the kickbacks that were happening due to, due to overpricing. Then the DC will take place with the um, employer and then also we refer if there's criminal element we see there's evidence to refer now for also prosecution. We refer also to National Prosecuting Authority now to take further steps to prosecute that employee plus the supplier. But then on the supplier as well we take to special tribunal to recover those profits that were made unlawful due to that co collusion. But I believe as well, my head could also add on that. Ms. Advocate Motib. Thank you, Tolani. Okay. Okay, no thanks, my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Mkungo. Just to add on, uh, and I won't be long. Um, there's a very important point you made, a very important point you made that the you know, suppliers would say, you chose us, you know, and now why is it that you're calling it corruption, you know? Uh, so that collusion part that he's, he's referring to, because I mean more often you'd go out as government or department, go out and tender or request for quotations or whatever the case may be. But we have found during the investigation that there's a collusion that certain suppliers would have probably been preferred uh, un irregularly, unfairly, and so on. So, so when we go and to the to the special tribunal to recover, uh, of course we do, you know, acknowledge that part. I mean, there's a legal concept to those who understand that once we've cancelled the contract, because at the special tribunal we cancel the contract and we seek to recover, right? So, so when the judges do that recovery process, they do they apply the concept called just and equitable, you know, assessment. Up in in that process, they check what is it that you as the service provider have uh, provided as a service and so on, so that you know you don't really lose out uh, from what you have uh, delivered. But of course, you can't keep the profits, uh, as 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 you say, because this was an irregular process. So. So, so you, 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 you really uh, get a, 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 a slap or a punishment of some sort, but recognizing that you have, you have delivered. In terms of overpricing, it's also important that we work closely with other agencies over and above recovering. Uh, we also work closely with our competition authority. Uh, we refer uh, companies who showed that they were you know, anti-competitive, and there's been a recent one now, uh, last week, where our competition commission slapped one company with a four million fine uh, to pay back uh, their, their overpricing. And on the other hand, we are also busy with a litigation process to ensure that uh, uh, they don't really gain from this. With regard to the disciplinary process and the litigation, there is no, there is no uh, legal consideration to say you can't start with the disciplinary action process while we are busy with the litigation. Uh, we have also engaged with our prosecuting authority. Uh, more often they would say, you know, don't start with the disciplinary process because, you know, the evidence, this, this, this and that. Uh, but we, we've got uh, checks and balances so that we don't delay any of the processes to start to make sure that, you know, we bring out consequence management speedily. Thank you for... The clarification intrude a lot of um, procurement issues uh, were thrown up during the COVID-19. The emergency situation itself provided avenue for people to exploit the loopholes of fear. So there was generally that issue of overpricing. There was the issue of undersupply because of the same collusion 
And there was also the issue of substandard supplies across the globe, especially in our own climes. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you once again, the presenters and Dr. Rogers. Thank you very much for yielding the ground to us. Thank you.